A very good, good evening to all our participants who have joined us here today. I, Professor Bhushan Shinde, welcome you all on behalf of Vivekan Education Society's College of Law for the webinar on impact of COVID-19 on digital space and increasing importance of cyber law. Our guest speaker today is an expert in the field of cyber law, Mr. Gokul Narayan, sir, who is the Chief Operations Officer of Asian School of Cyber Law. It is said that this is the new normal. This new normal gets also gets with it newer problems and challenges, which requires to be handled in a novel fashion. It is with this objective in mind that VES College of Law has organized the webinar with a topic relevant to this new norm, the impact of COVID-19 on digital space and increasing importance of cyber. Without much delay, let's begin with today's webinar. To start with, let, let me share a few uh, let me share a brief introduction about our institute, that is the Vekan Education Society's College of Law. The concept of legal education in India goes back to the Vedic age, when law was understood much as a branch of dharma. The Vedas were the original sources of law, wherein sadachara, custom, nyaya, and yukti were the basis of legal procedure. The aim of legal education is to bring about reformation in the traditional legal system by developing skill sets concerning counseling clients interviewing witnesses effectively and negotiating with parties at the appropriate time of it, at the appropriate time moreover the supreme court is of the view that legal education should be able to meet the ever growing demands of society and should be thoroughly equipped enough to cater the complexities of different situations and circumstances it is this with objective in mind that vs college of law was established in the year 2009 VES College of Law is a prestigious member of the Vivekan Education Society that has sheltered over 20,000 students under its tree of wisdom and its door opens for many more from KG to PG. As an institute, VES has undertaken the Herculean task of producing not just professionals, but responsible citizens of tomorrow. Citizens that one day would shoulder the responsibility of our great nation and facilitate its progress as it marches on the path to become a global power. Therefore, of the said vision uh, of, uh, of increasing the intellectual wealth of our great nation in the year 2009. Practical education is the need of the art, and we at V College of Law completely in consonance with this fact. In furtherance of the same, our college organizes a, a variety of events in the form of intra and intercollegiate. We have, we have various competitions, seminars, workshops like this one. This is the virtual one and guest lectures on various legal and social legal topics to provide the students a platform to develop, hone, and polish their practical skill sets. The college organizes a host of signature events, namely our marquee event, that is Sri Hashuji Adwani Memorial National Moot Court Competition, which was started in the year way back in the year 2011-12. And from a first edition of an intercollegiate level, today we have reached a national level, wherein we have uh, teams coming from various states and uh, union territories. At the national level, we received teams from 13 Indian states and two union territories consisting of top Indian law schools and universities across the country. As a part of our responsibility towards society, the college has also organized a legal aid counseling cell, and which is recognized by the government of Maharashtra, wherein counseling is imparted to society at large every Saturday. Apart from this, we organize a host of intercollegiate competitions guest lectures and seminars on various issues. Over the years, VES College of Law has played host to many distinguished legal luminaries in the field of law and education. The list is quite long. We have, we have, been, we have been blessed with the presence of the, we have been blessed with the presence of Justice J.N. Patel, Justice P. D. Kode, Justice R. Y. Ganu, Justice Achulia, Justice Makaran Karlik, and many more lawyers like Justice Satish Maneshinda as well. We have also been blessed by various academicians like Dr. Rajan Vedukar, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Vijay Kone, and many more. Last year, VES College of Law completed its 10th year of inception. And our academic journey through this tough time as well is on with Swami Vivekananda's golden words, arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Without much delay, uh, I would like to introduce the guest for today's uh, webinar, Mr. Gokul Naran, sir. Sir has done his bachelor's and master's from Symbiosis Law School today and has worked in various roles and capacities since then. Starting off as an associate with KJ John and Company and advocate Rajiv Sahai, Sir later joined as a legal advisor with Symbiosis School of Liberal Arts. 
Sir has also worked as a faculty of cyber law with various institutes, teaching issues related to cyber laws, and has also been a director of Data64 Tech Techno Solutions, private limited. Sir has also worked as an on-site director with Knowledge Exchange Initiative, uh, New York. Sir is currently the Chief Operations Officer, Business Development and Academics of Asian Civil of Cyber Law, and has been working in this capacity since 2016. We extend a warm welcome to you, sir, once again. Over to you, sir. No cool knowledge. Thank you, sir. Sir's audio is off. off right. All right. Is my volume audible now? Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Bhushan sir, for the introduction and the opportunity to uh, participate in this webinar and uh, speak to your participants and students. Uh, thank you so much for logging in. It's a Saturday evening. I know everybody has plans. Uh, and I'm being sarcastic when I say that because I don't think anybody has any plans nowadays. Everybody is sitting at home and trying to as productively use their time as possible. It's a strange time, like, like uh, Sir very categorically said, it's unprecedented times. We've never experienced anything like this before. We've never seen situations like this before where families and uh, individuals are brought together. It is unprecedented in every which way possible. And therefore, what we have been confronted with is a peculiar set of circumstances relating to the cyber world that have come in front of us. Now, what I will try and do in this webinar is initially address these points of vulnerability that have come up because of the existence of this new age virtual world that we are confronted with. Um, at the end, I'll throw um, it open to the participants to ask questions and Bhushan sir and I together will uh, uh, will try and answer the questions to the best of our ability. So please, uh, since this is a live um, YouTube live, I won't be able to interact with you um, whenever you have a question, but we will entertain all the questions at the end of the webinar. So let's begin. Now, what we need to understand about the digital world is something which is extremely simple. In terms of vulnerability, in terms of, uh, in terms of security threats, in terms of privacy, the individual, that is the person itself, becomes the most important basic fulcrum of this entire process. Now, if you look at this, the person as the most essential element of this virtual world, you will understand that all threats are therefore targeted towards the person. Now, there will be various means in which these threats are created, they are targeted, and they are put forth. But the basic problem remains the individual in itself. Now, with respect to the individual, where do you find this information becomes the next question that becomes relevant. The individual information can be found out either through information that we ourselves put out to the world, through social media platforms. Like for example, I have an Instagram handle. I have an Instagram handle for my uh, institution that is Asian School of Cyber Laws. I put out information over there. I've got a Facebook account. Um, I put out information over there relating to me, which I want the world to know. Now, this is one of the ways in which the information is made available to third parties about us. Uh, you could have a Twitter handle. You could have, um, now that TikTok is banned, it's not available. You could have put up content on TikTok, but basically one of the ways of finding out information about in, uh, people is the information that they choose to put out. The second one is the information that is held or stored in the devices that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, which would include your desktop, your laptop, your mobile phone. Primarily, your mobile phone becomes one of the greatest sources of information for you. This is where the vulnerability begins. Because at the end of the day, anybody who is trying to compromise the virtual world is attacking the individual either through the information that is made publicly available by her or him, or 
by getting into or infiltrating into the devices that the individual owns through vulnerabilities that the devices have. Now, it is also important to understand that there is no perfect security system. It doesn't exist. Uh, perfection in security does not exist. What does exist is a certain level of complexity to your security that can be brought about to ensure that you are not extremely vulnerable. Now, for example, even when you live in a house, you've got your walls protecting you, you've got your doors, you've got your locks, um, you bolt your house at night when you sleep, you shut the windows and doors, you've got grills on them. But that still doesn't mean that people can't enter your house without permission. Similarly, even in the virtual world or the digital space, irrespective of what security features you implement on your devices, on your uh, virtual space in terms of cloud uh, space, the compromise of the information can take place. There is no system which will ensure 100% protection for anything. But our attempt over here is to try and ensure that we make it as safe as possible. And we understand the law that is governing this field to the extent that we are able to figure out what does the law protect and what does it not protect? Now, all of you, to a certain extent, will be aware of the fact that the laws in India protect, for example, privacy. Let me just begin with one of the questions of privacy. Privacy in two ways. There is privacy of data and then there is privacy of uh, the human body also. So a certain set of laws which are trying to protect the privacy of the human body, that nobody compromises my privacy, where they take pictures or photographs or videos of me um, in a private place where I feel comfortable to disrobe, for example. I want my privacy to be protected there. And privacy of my data in terms of the information that I hold in my various devices. It could be personal information relating to my health, psychological condition, uh, financial condition. All of this information becomes relevant. And what has happened because of COVID, see the virtual space was always a vulnerable place. But its vulnerability was not so exaggerated prior to February 2020. Now, why do I say that? I say this because, and I say this very categorically because prior to 2020, the internet was divided or users in the virtual world were divided into people who swear by the virtual world, live on the virtual world, have a virtual presence and existence, and those who were there on it very moderately and a large uh, portion of it, which generally included um, not technologically savvy individuals who avoided it completely because they didn't understand it. Now, come February 2020, the digital space started changing. The government of India, just like the governments of various other countries, decided that the best way to deal with the coronavirus pandemic was to create um, and implement a nationwide lockdown. Now, we've realized over a period of time, and see, since in living past history, um, we don't have too much of information on how effectively lockdowns can control pandemics, because the only other information that we have is during World War I of the Spanish flu. And uh, uh, because uh, the world was not so much, uh, so well connected because of the virtual world, we have lesser information available about how the Spanish flu actually uh, broke through, how was it controlled, how did it finally die out. The, inf the amount of information available is lesser, but in this today's digital world, information is one of our strongest points. We get information, we can acquire information, and therefore it becomes slightly detrimental also because sometimes you've got too much of information available. Now, having said that, um, what happened in the digital space post February 2020 was that the number of people who started using the internet who were earlier not using it drastically increased. Because we were in a lockdown and one of the first things that started do, uh, the government started opening up was the uh, essential services industry. Now they said that food is an, uh, a, a, an essential requirement, um, medical uh, 
things are an um, are, are a essential requirement, and they started opening up um, the economies slowly. One of the first things that again, because of that, happened was there was a complete influx of individuals who were using online websites, shopping carts, um, e-commerce sites for satisfying their daily needs, shopping needs, your grocery requirements, and things like this, which basically meant people who are not used to the internet now also were forced to come onto the internet and start using them. This basically creates a whole separate problem of people who are forced to use technology but don't understand the vulnerability that technology has. The number of scams that have increased just post-March 2020, uh, as opposed to the December of 2019 or January of 2020, is about six times. It's increased six times, which basically means it's not that the internet has suddenly become a vulnerable place. The internet is as vulnerable as it was earlier. The number of cyber threats that have increased have actually become simpler. They've become simpler because of the lack of understanding of a lot of users who are coming online. Now, let me begin with a few examples after having explained to you the fact that the virtual space is only as vulnerable as its users are. What all of these individuals who are trying to compromise the virtual space are trying to do is trying to make use of the lack of understanding of individuals and the vulnerability that inherently exists in devices. Now, what is this vulnerability that I'm talking about? The vulnerability that I'm talking about is every device has is only as secure as the person who's using it is. So for any threat, to effectively mount itself, there has to be some kind of cooperation by the individual holding or controlling the device. Now, in terms of these threats, what do these individuals eventually want? They either want our money, they, all, they might also want to harm our reputation, or they might want to threaten us. If you can broadly divide the virtual space into the kind of crimes that are taking place, you can look at these three large uh, portions. Somebody who wants to threaten us, this kind of vulnerability will be there only for a certain number of individuals. It's not something that we are commonly, commonly faced. Now, I've, for example, nobody's ever tried to threaten me on the internet. I, I know of people who've been threatened on the internet, but it's not a common happening. Secondly, trying to spoil a person's reputation. Now, this is a little bit more common than threatening, uh, trying to spoil a person's reputation by saying things on social media platforms. Whenever you put up a post, if people start commenting on the post, you've got a view, a point of view, which is contrary to uh, general opinion. And then people start commenting on it and saying things which are disrespectful, defamatory. This also happens, but this also happens much lesser. These Both these things generally happen at a personal attack level where people who know you or know of you or are acquainted with you start talking about you. The most common threat is the threat relating to compromising your financial information. Now, this is not personal at all. The hackers or the people who are trying to get this information out of you are generally trying to find any victim. You may happen to be just one of the victims that fall for the trap that they set. Post-March 2020, the nature of the traps that are being set have increased, but not become more complicated. They're the same kind of uh, traps, but they are, they've changed the nature of the traps considering COVID and the restriction of being closed and not being allowed to move around. You have to understand, Internet bandwidths have become slower because of the number of people using it. Information relating to frauds are coming up, but people aren't reading that information as seriously as they should. And there is a complete lack of understanding of laws pertaining to this field. And therefore, the Information Technology Act in today's scenario becomes the most, and I'm saying the most important law that you have to understand to function in this digital changing digital virtual environment 
please understand this. We are never going back to January of 2020. The world's never going to look like January of 2020, even when things go back to um, a more normal way of existence where we are not constantly in a lockdown. I don't know what Mumbai is right now, Delhi, where I am currently. We are in a semi-lockdown kind of state. There are restrictions on move, movement, but those restrictions have also been slowly lifted by the government. The Delhi government and the UP government keep imposing these restrictions depending upon the number of cases that spike. Uh, on the days that there's a spike, the next day becomes a lockdown, and then they remove the lockdown two or three days later when the spike goes down, and then they impose it again. So strange times. So let's begin with one of the most common threats which have started happening because of the advent of this pandemic. Now, one of the direct correlations between being locked up at home and the use of the digital space is a very great and drastic spike in watching of pornography. Now this is documented, this is information that has been um, looked at and studied. There's a drastic increase in people watching pornography. And because of that, there's a drastic increase in frauds relating to the viewing of pornography also. Now you must be wondering, abhi, porno pornography ke relation mein fraud kya hoga? Now one of the attacks that is taking place is um, the extortion porn scam, which basically is, and, and this is something that I know because I know people personally who've been affected by it. An email comes to you with your name and possibly one of your passwords to one of your accounts saying that we have seen you watching porn and you watch this kind of porn. And um, if you do not, and we've got videos to, uh, videos to prove the fact that we've seen you watching porn and these are the porn videos that you're watching. If you do not pay us a certain sum of money, then we will make these videos public. Now, how did I get to know about this? I have a 78 year old aunt who lives in the United States of America. She lives in Austin. And she emailed me and said, Gokul, I have received this kind of an email. And she said, I don't watch pornography. And I was like, that's all right. What is the email that you've received? So she showed me the email. It had information about one of her Apple accounts and the password that was mentioned was correct, but it was an older password. It was not the current password that she had. She said, the, what, what I'm worried about is the fact that there is a password. The password's correct, but it's an older password. So has somebody broken into my uh, laptop? And has my information been compromised? And what do I do with this information? Then this kind of an in, uh, this kind of an email came to another friend of mine who's a 32 year old woman. There's another email which came to a friend of mine who is a 46 year old man. So I I realized that there is a trend to it. The trend to these emails is they cast the widest net possible, and they try to send this email across because your your Email ID is not something which is very difficult to find. There are databases available which can be bought at a penny's price. You get a large number of email IDs which you can buy off the internet at a throwaway price. You can use that um, email um, uh, database to send random randomized emails out by syncing your um, Excel sheet with the email IDs and the names along with the passwords. Now, where do they get the passwords from? Old passwords or combination of old passwords are also sold when they are compromised. So, for example, um, some time ago, uh, Yahoo information was compromised. There were about more than a few million passwords that were compromised. Facebook was compromised some time back. Now, once this is compromised and this information is extracted, very often it finds it, its way on what is referred to as the dark web, where it gets sold. Um, the price that is charged for this is also very little. So, a lot of people end up buying it. Now, what these hackers end up doing is, since they realize that there's a very large increase in the number of people watching pornography, they send these random emails out to everybody saying, we've watched you watching pornography, you pay us money, or we're going to make this information um, public. Now, one of three things are going to happen, um, broadly speaking. A, you're going to ignore the email, which is what you should do. There's nothing to worry about. They don't have your password. They've not compromised your laptop. They've not gotten inside your laptop. Um, they don't have your information. They've just bought some information off the internet which they're trying to use to convince you 
to do something. Now, the second second reaction could be you reply to them saying that um, you start interacting with them. This is what they want. They want people to start interacting with them. Now, after the interaction starts off, it could go one of two ways. Either you end up paying for the um, for, for the whatever extortion they're able to extort out of you, whatever money they're able to extort out of you. Or in the contrary, you end up having a dialogue with them where you say, you send me the video. I want to see the video where you've um, seen me watching porn. They will send you a link, which will say, this is the video link. You click on the link and you'll be able to see the video. And this is where the scam actually starts. If you end up paying the money, then it's okay. But if you end up asking them for a video, and you click on the link, what it then starts off is a download into your computer, which then compromises your computer. It could be a worm, it could be a Trojan, it could be a virus, it could be a keylogger, it could be any kind of content which gets then downloaded into your system and then starts compromising the data available on your system, which could be financial information, it could be personal information, and then actually speaking, they could get into your uh, laptop and record your video, or you could get into your phone and record your video. Now, because of the fact that virtually everybody nowadays uses their mobile phone, and, and this is also a recent trend, uh, we didn't have mobile phones prior to 2000, 2000. We didn't have cameras in mobile phones prior to 2003. We certainly didn't have the habit of taking the mobile phone and going into the washroom or the loo and spending um, hours of time inside the, the loo with our mobile phones, which basically puts us in a slightly vulnerable position, both physically uh, in terms of ailments that can be contracted because of uh, being in a, um, in a washroom for a, a large period of time. Along with that, the vulnerability of also being in a compromised state of undress, which with the camera pointed directly at your face or your body parts as the case may be, because all of these mobile phones have two facing cameras. So you've got a camera which is facing down, there's a camera that is facing up. You basically are in a vulnerable position if your device itself has been compromised. And this is where the device compromise begins, where because when you click on that link, there are downloads which will start off into your system, which will then compromise the integrity of your system. What do you do about this? Ignore that email. We will go into the data security and the security of your device part uh, shortly. But I just wanted to say this about the email in itself. Just ignore the email. Now, in terms of payment of, uh, payment of um, the extorted money, what has recently happened is the Reserve Bank of India, and this is also very important with respect to um, uh, how cybercrime is evolving. Recently, the Reserve Bank of India lifted its ban, which was imposed in 2018 on cryptocurrencies. 2018, the Reserve Bank of India had said that because of the kind of uh, misuse that cryptocurrencies are being put to, the Reserve Bank of India said that the only currency which would be transacted in India would be the Indian currency or currencies that it recognizes. Okay. Cryptocurrency, it did not recognize and it says it's illegal. No banking services will be provided with respect to cryptocurrency. So you couldn't go up to an HDFC bank and then say that I want to open up a crypto account. It, it wasn't allowed. In, um, I think this happened in May of 2020, um, just now, uh, last month. The Reserve Bank of India lifted that ban. Now they said that banking institutions are free to provide services with respect to cryptocurrency, which basically means that the use and the exchange of cryptocurrency is now legalized. It's still not that you can walk into any bank. You walk into a, a Canara bank or a, a Vilasrao Sahakari bank and um, uh, ask them to open up a cryptocurrency account, they're not going to be able to do it. it. It is still the choice of the bank to start offering services with respect to cryptocurrency, but that's a very major change that has taken place that cryptocurrencies are now legal again. We can um, indulge in cryptocurrencies. Now, along with this, because of the fact that cryptocurrencies have now become legal and financial transactions are now very, very common online. You, you yourself will try and uh, uh, understand this by 
viewing your spending habits just over the past three months, the amount of money that you would have spent or your parents would have spent or your family members would have spent or your friends and relatives would have spent online would have drastically increased. Cash has suddenly gone down. The use of virtual uh, wallets, UPIs, all of this has drastically increased. Because of this, a whole lot of scams have started off. Now, as soon as one of the largest scams that, are, that is taking place nowadays is in the first half of the pandemic, that is, I'm talking about post March 20th till about the end of April, the largest scam that was happening was a donation scam, which was um, fake donation sites coming up to, uh, to take money away from unsuspecting people who after looking at, for example, news clips from Aaj Tak and India Today and CNBC and uh, Al Jazeera and all that felt extremely bad about the financial situations that our migrant workers and our um, uh, the unstructured part of our labor economy was facing, and it was it was horrible to see people walking without food, without water, and people started contributing money who had money who were financially secure started contributing money. The problem was they were not looking at what they were contributing to. Now, the Prime Minister's Relief Fund was the most vulnerable in this regard. Not the Prime Minister's Relief Fund in itself, but the lack of ability of individuals to discern between the original Prime Minister's Relief Fund and anything that just called itself the Prime Minister's Relief Fund. If you go online and Prime Minister's Relief Fund, dalte, to about, you would have come up uh, up with about 30 different Prime Minister's Relief Fund. Uh, there were versions of it, Prime Minister's Relief Fund, Delhi, Prime Minister's Relief Fund, Kerala, Prime Minister's Relief Fund, West Bengal, Prime Minister's Relief Fund, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, all of these different kind of Prime Minister's Relief Fund and depending upon who and what you were and what you affiliated with, Prime Minister's Relief Fund for widows, Prime Minister's Relief Fund for um, uh, 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 army officers, there, there's, a, there's a whole lot of Prime Minister's Relief Fund. There is, theoretically speaking, only one Prime Minister's Relief Fund to which the contribution is taken and then distributed depending upon um, what the money has been collected for. But these fake uh, links started collecting money and transferring it to unscrupulous people who had nothing to do with anything charitable, who had nothing to do with anything uh, to provide uh, rescue services for people who were stranded, nothing at all. They were just extracting money. Now, this is a problem that the individual faces because if I am not sure whose account I'm transferring the money to, it becomes solely and wholly my responsibility. And then there's nothing that you can turn around and say, Ki isne kia hai, usne kia. Yeah. Basically, ho kya raha hai yahan pe aap ek bank account ke andar paise transfer kar rahe hai, bina ye pata ki hai ki wo bank account kis ka hai. And after the bank account, the money is transferred into the bank account. There's nothing that the bank or anybody else can do about returning that money back to you. Um, a lot of other scams also took, started happening. After uh, services started resuming, there are two scams. And, and it's, it's very, very funny how these two scams are have gone very... Um, in similar patterns over the last one and a half, two months. One is a liquor scam, where there is free home delivery of liquor. I mean, obviously, people may have, some people may have stocked up alcohol in their houses prior to the uh, pandemic starting off. But after the pandemic um, was through a few days and the liquor shops finally opened up, there was a liquor scam that started off, where people started saying that if you want liquor delivered to your house, um, as, uh, contact us and we will get information and we will get the liquor down to your house. So what they used to do was uh, put up their ads on Instagram, put up their ads on Google, put up their ads um, in, in flyers, give their information to, uh, to uh, security guards in, um, um, in, in apartments and say that we are providing this service. The people, all the people need to do is they need to contact us on this mobile phone number. Mobile phone number, after they contacted on the mobile phone number, they said that since we're going to be procuring this information, uh, this liquor from the liquor store and takes a lot of time to stand in line and get the liquor, we want the money in advance. You send the money across, you keep waiting for the liquor, no person's delivering anything to you, the liquor's never arrived, the money is gone. And, and because it's a pandemic, people started uh, 
requesting a lot of liquor. I mean, there are people who've been duped of 20,000, 30,000 rupees because they asked for expensive liquor to be home delivered because they didn't want to step out and their expensive liquor at home was drying out. Um, the liquor scam happened. Then another scam that happened, which is a slightly less voluminous scam, but the PPE, uh, the post personal protection uh, kit scam. Now, uh, this scam happened because they said one of the most effective ways of protecting yourself from the coronavirus is having a personal protection kit, um, wear gloves, wear the shield, um, have the have that kind of suit on, and all of this will be home delivered to you. This is the best way of protecting yourself from the coronavirus if you need to step out, wear this. And there's a whole lot of people who then ordered this content online. Some people did not go on to Amazon and order it. They didn't go on to Flipkart and order it, but they went on to local advertisements that they saw, clicked on it, transferred the money across to them. Again, never got the PPE kits. The, uh, the volume of this fraud is, in, in terms of number of people who fell for this fraud is a lot larger, but the ticket price of the fraud itself is much smaller. The PPE kit costs about 300 to 500 rupees, and this is the kind of money that they were extorting. Uh, it also was with respect to uh, moratorium frauds. Now, one of the things that the Reserve Bank of India did initially was because there was no income coming in, in the initial phases of the lockdown and people weren't allowed to move out, what they said was that the banks are, are not going to collect loan installments. They're not going to collect uh, money from uh, people who owe them money, but the interest will keep carrying on. So you can defer the payment of your installments if you're short of money, but what you needed to do was to contact the bank. It wouldn't automatically happen. Now what people started doing was, people started calling you saying that I'm available from so-and-so bank, I'm from so-and-so um, uh, customer service department. Uh, do you have a loan for which you want to seek moratorium? Or they started putting up uh, creating websites on which get your moratorium ne needs met immediately, um, avoid long banking procedures and things like that. So these are websites that came up, people clicked on them or they interacted with people on the phone. They said that, yes, we want uh, the moratorium uh, shifted. Uh, we want to exercise the moratorium right that the Reserve Bank of India has provided. Uh, how do we go about doing this? Then they started giving their personal information out. Uh, they said that you will have to, however, and, and this also this fraud also had various um, ways in which it was executed. It had uh, instances where people were giving out personal information or their uh, financial information, basically the same kind of fraud executed with a different mask on. Now, if you realize all of these frauds are just basically trying to take your money from you, they're just wearing different masks and in different ways, they're trying to steal their money, depending upon what you will react to. And it, it's an individual choice. You have to donation. Karna hai. या आपको पीपी किट चाहिए आपको अल्कोहल खरीदना है आपको ग्रोसरीज खरीदने हैं आपको ग्रोसरीज के रिलेशन में भी सिमिलर काइंड ऑफ फ्रॉड्स दैट टुक प्लेस यू गो ऑन टू द रॉन्ग वेबसाइट यू क्लिक ऑन द रॉन्ग डेटा इंफॉर्मेशन गेट्स डाउनलोडेड इनटू योर कंप्यूटर और यू पे अप द मनी एंड इट नेवर कम्स टू यू एज द केस मे बी नाउ दिस रिसेंटली ओवर द पास्ट टू थ्री वीक्स हैज टेकन अ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ अ a fraud system wherein um, there are people who are calling up saying that they are from uh, the armed forces. The armed forces frauds is what I've seen happening. Um, they say that they are from the armed forces and they're contacting small business owners saying that they want the services that the small business owners are providing. Um, so for example, one of my students who also manufactures uh, on the side candles got called by uh, this person supposedly from the Indian army. Obviously this person was not from the Indian army. Um, saying that they're posing to be an Indian Army uh, personnel, giving a fake ID card and all that, saying that I'm Indian Army. Se hai. And as a part of uh, the Indian Army services, what we are doing is we uh, we are uh, helping out certain institutions by giving them products to sell. So we want to buy candles from you and we want to give it to this NGO who will then be selling these candles and making money. And um, they said that, can you give it to us at a discount, making it sound as if... Um, as if this, this entire system is legit where the Indian Army is just helping out uh, certain NGOs and the payment will be made, uh, the payment will be made from the relief fund of the uh, Indian, uh, Indian Army and things like this. Now, now, for those of you who may not know, 
Just one second, I'm running short of battery. Just one second, please. Now, for those of you, I'm sorry, for those of you who may not know about this, the Indian Army does not contact individuals just like that. One of the members of the Indian Army will not get up and say that, okay, I'm going to procure it. Procurement in the Indian Army is a very long drawn out procedure, which has a lot of safety checks and they just randomly don't contact private individuals and um, uh, do their processes like this. But a lot of people don't know about how the Indian Army functions. And just because they see an ID card, they fall for um, the information of the person who's uh, uh, pretending to be an armed forces personnel. Um, what they basically do is then they, after the discussions are over, they say that we will need, uh, they send you a QR code saying that we will need first just to establish a connect between your organization and ours. And so that the Indian Army can do a UPI transfer of the money to you. You need to click on a QR code. It, it's a five rupee transaction that will take place. And it says five rupees on the QR code. You click on the, you click on the QR code using your WhatsApp or um, uh, Google Pay or Phone Pay or whatever uh, UPI system that you're using. It will scan that QR code and it will transfer five rupees after you press enter and you feed in your um, OTP. It will transfer five rupees to your account. That will establish a link between the Indian Army account and your account. And therefore, we can then proceed. Uh, this basically starts off, unfortunately, something which is extremely different. It says five rupees. It will not show you the transaction amount after it is clicked, but it will try taking out at least in the, in the instances that I've seen at least 10,000 rupees in one go. Um, after you put in your username, uh, after you put in your um, banking credentials, uh, it will immediately transfer the money to the account. Uh, number phone the person's obviously not going to answer your calls. And that's going to be the end of the money that you've um, actually suddenly just donated. Now, please understand this. These kind of frauds have existed earlier also, but the nature of these frauds and the question or the story behind the fraud is changing with COVID. That's all that is happening. And I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing on this again and again. Then... Now, these are the kind of frauds that are taking place. And, and I can go on and on with all kinds of various frauds that are taking place. But this is not the only problems that we are facing. Uh, uh, just, just to wind up before uh, with the fraud section, uh, there are frauds which took place with respect to the Arogya Setu app. Government said Arogya Setu app is essential. You need to go in the Mitro app and the Arogya Setu app for again, just overnight just exploded. What did people do? What did hackers do? They said there are a lot of people who don't know the internet very well. Our Ogya Setu app has been made essential. Now, irrespective of, the, of how old you are. So, for example, my father uh, currently is going through treatment uh, for cancer. And therefore, we need to take him to the hospital. He has a smartphone. It's mandatory for him to have that Arogya Setu app on his smartphone. Now, imagine if I was not available to download it for him. He's 78 years old. He doesn't understand the internet that well. His, his ability to, to distinguish between an original app and a fake app is very, very limited. Now, if he, what is he going to do? He would have asked somebody, how do I download the app? They would have said, go to the Play Store, type in Arogya Setu, and you will see the app, click on download and download it. Now, the Play Store itself had about six versions of the Arogya Setu app, five of which were illegal. Um, Available in the Play Store doesn't make the app real. Other people who did not know that they needed to um, download the app from the Play Store typed in Arogya Setu app download on Google. Google showed them all the links that were available. Please understand, Google is a search engine. It will just give you information about the search that you made. And wherever it finds the words Arogya Setu app download, it is going to show you that link. Now, it depends upon you which link you click on. You clicked on the link, Arogya Setu app gets downloaded onto your laptop, onto your mobile phone, and that's it. Fake apps, all, all of these fake UPI apps, uh, phone pay, Google pay, all of these have fake versions of it available if you don't know how which, which the real one is. Now, imagine um, a Google pay app, which you're downloading, which has only about 30,000 downloads. Is it possible? It should, it should strike a bell immediately in your um, uh, in your mind saying that this cannot be google pay is one of the most popular um, payment gateways or systems that have been used in india today it's not possible that it has only 30000 downloads 
So very preliminary basic checks that can be made to ensure that your um, data and your, in, uh, your personal privacy is not compromised. Now let's, let's step away from frauds because I said frauds are just one aspect of the kind of problems that are facing. The digital world in terms of the information technology age is facing a lot more problems. For example, Hindustan Unilever and uh, Record Ben Kaiser went into a disparagement problem uh, at the beginning of uh, COVID. This is around March, early March uh, 2020. Sorry, mid-March 2020. Now, what was the case? Now, that all went up against Lifebuoy. What was happening was, um, all of these companies, soap manufacturing companies, came up with ads saying that to protect yourself from coronavirus, wash your hands regularly, use our soap, it kills 99.99% viruses, and so on and so forth. The more uh, you wash your hand, the less the possibility of the virus sticking onto your hands and then getting transferred. Now, the WHO in itself is very confused as to how the how effectively the uh, the virus transfers itself, but we know very much for sure that it is through touch, through fingers, that the access is gone to the orifices of the face through which it enters the body. So either you touch your face, you touch your nose, uh, you you uh, scrub your eyes. It can go in through these these because it has to enter the system somehow. How does it enter the system? It can enter through your nose. It can enter through your mouth. It can enter through the eyes if the virus is there on your hand somewhere. Now, because of this, uh, soap companies came up with ads saying that, apne aapko coronavirus se bachaiye, haad dhoiye. Uh, that all had an ad which said, which suggested that hand wash, the, the hand wash is more effective at killing the coronavirus than a regular bar of soap. And in their ad, they had a red colored soap in the background on which there was a cross. And they said, protect yourself from uh, coronavirus use the hand wash of the doll. Obviously, red bar of soap in India means life boy. It's the most popular soap in India. You may not be using it, but in terms of sheer number of sales, life boy is the largest selling soap in India. Everybody knew it was life boy that they're taking a dig at. Lifeboy went and filed a case against them saying that this is disparagement, this is an infringement of our trademark. You are, you are reducing the estimation of us in the eyes of our customers by saying something which is not true. The WHO never said that hand washes are better at stopping coronavirus than bars of soap are. This is a presumption you're making. You don't have any scientific background for it and you're trying to affect our sales and increase yours in, the, in, in this regard. Now, there was a preliminary hearing done that all immediately said they will withdraw the ad. The disparagement suit still goes on. It's not been decided as yet. There's a hearing which is going to happen sometime in uh, July. Um, and uh, you can keep following the case. It's a very interesting case that has happened. Now, this is with respect to trademark wars. Then uh, something extremely exciting that happened um, in terms of digital privacy or data privacy was um, there was a case that took place in... Um, um, in, in the High Court, where uh, the Delhi High Court passed judgment stating the fact that in a conflict between data privacy or in the conflict between providing data or evidence which is relevant for a particular case and the right to privacy, the means of justice have to be served. Now, let me try and explain what this complicated statement actually means. The case took place in terms of a divorce petition that was that was filed, and in which the husband who was filing, who had filed for divorce on the grounds of cruelty against the wife, uh, produced in a in a family court a recording of the wife speaking to her friend over a phone, and he recorded this in which he was saying she was expressing her anger and grief and saying the fact that. Um, her uh, talking about her in-laws and her husband and saying stuff, which was demeaning, derogatory, uh, defamatory, if, 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 if it may be so-called. Um, some of it was untrue, false. The husband took this video recording, uh, uh, took this audio recording and produced it as evidence to substantiate his case on for grounds of cruelty in the family court. The family court accepted this. They said that, yes, this is relevant to our case and we will take this as information that is relevant. There was a, uh, an appeal which was filed on this specific ground, an objection that was taken. Um, the objection was overruled by the family court. 
it went to the high court and the high court was asked to choose between these two. Now, please understand the right to privacy is a fundamental right. The wife is saying that I have a right to privacy that cannot, that cannot be compromised because it's a fundamental right. Now, the court, on, on the other hand, turned around and said, yes, it is a fundamental right. But the rights of justice are also something which are extremely important, which basically means what the court has ended up doing is, at least in terms of matrimonial disputes, it's gone on to say that evidence, even if illegally acquired, evidence, even if illegally acquired, but are, is relevant to the case at hand, can be produced as evidence in a court of law. This, however, does not preclude, does not stop the wife from proceeding against the husband for invasion of the right to privacy and proceed separately against them. The fact that it has been illegally procured does not exclude that evidence from being produced in a court, in a court of law. That's the basic argument that was being made. Now, this is with respect to um, uh, data privacy. Now, a, a lot of uh, questions come up. Which is the law that, that the wife can use? Can the Information Technology Act or law provide a rescue to a situation like this? And questions like that. And the Information Technology Act keeps coming in in all these regards and in all these circumstances to try and see what kind of relief can be provided. In all the examples that, I, that I've that i spoken to you about, the Information Technology Act and its offshoots become extremely important for interpretation. Then um, questions relating to, let's, uh, let's talk about the boys' locker room controversy. Again, from the perspective of law, I'm not talking about the social ramifications of, of the boys' locker room controversy and how men should conduct themselves. Those are not debates or questions that I want to address. I want to look at it from the perspective of what had happened and what does the law say about it. Now, the law, why does this become important in today's day and age? The virtual world is where all of these discussions are happening. There are uh, private spaces in WhatsApp um, groups, in Instagram handles, in um, other social media platform where a close group of people are exchanging information. What does the law say about it? What is the responsibility that people have with respect to it? And this is where a lot of governmental control starts coming in, where the government starts controlling activities which are done online just to ensure that the citizens are safe. Like, for example, post um, COVID, post boys' locker room controversy um, and the problems that took place because even in the boys' locker room controversy, the administrator of the group, which was uh, of concern, was a major and a boy. The question arose, what is the responsibility of the administrator of a WhatsApp group with respect to the information that is disseminated? There were legislations which were passed. Mumbai police has come out with orders for making the administrator responsible. Assam's come out with the Assam COVID regulations, making administrators responsible for fake news, making administrators responsible for, um, uh, for dissemination of information on their um, uh, platforms and saying that if you are an administrator, you take up the responsibility. It is your responsibility to ensure that information which is fake in nature is not disseminated. Again, creates controversies, creates problems. When I am an administrator in a group, um, till, the, till the happening of these laws and the kind of controversies that took place, I wasn't very aware of who was exchanging what kind of information on the group that I created. I just created the group. I just happened to be one of those people who put the people onto the group. And therefore, by that stretch of imagination, I became the administrator. But now, I don't want to be an administrator in any group. Uh, it, it is an unnecessarily res unnecessary responsibility that I face. There are certain groups, like for example, I'm a, I'm a group member of a group of lawyers. Now, some of those lawyers I know personally, some of them are acquaintances, some of them I don't know at all. But professionally, because I am, I am a part of the legal fraternity, I have to be a part of these kind of groups also. Now, in these kind of groups, what individual posts what kind of information, I don't even look most of the time. So there will be days... For four or five days, I won't check that group. Now, if some information comes up on that group, what is my responsibility? Again, COVID, again, governmental uh, control to try and curb um, dissemination of false fake news. There's a lot of uh, anti-national news that came about trying to blame the Modi government for the lack of um, control that they have exercised. Uh, there's a lot of uh, racist uh, comments that were made. 
there were specific targeting of certain communities that were made that this community is responsible for it so hate messages all of these kind of things started happening service providers started reacting to this um i have about 5 minutes more i'll try and wind up very quickly so that i can give you some time to um, to ask questions also i'm sorry because there's so much to speak about these topics that it becomes a little difficult to um to put everything into a small one hour capsule and speak to you about so um for example let me speak about two things that whatsapp and twitter did whatsapp basically said that uh forwards which become extremely popular can then not be sent to uh, more than one person at a time so whatsapp as it is has a restriction of sending uh forwards to five people so you can send it to five people or five groups or five entities at one time but after a forward reaches a certain number Uh, in in terms of dissemination then it says that you can only forward it one person at a time which basically has reduced the number of forwards and the forwarding drastically bahut kam ho gaya hai suddenly jo corona ke time pe increase hua tha wo bahut kam ho gaya hai because of this restriction that was implemented twitter on the other hand looked at it from a different angle it started taking up certain responsibility for the kind of information that was put up on their handle tweets that were put up like for example recently uh and it was so hilarious it was funny beyond belief and rather sad also at the same time uh donald trump uh, strange person in any case donald trump went about making some comments on how uh, bleach could be effective in controlling consumption of bleach could be one of the possible um ways of controlling the corona virus and i was just astounded he made, made a few other comments with respect to corona virus which were extremely controversial and then he also made comments with respect to the elections that are coming up he's saying so one of the things that the us constituency allows is vote by mail so you can post your mail you can post your vote with respect to the election and say that this is what my uh, candidature is i mean this is what my selection from the candidature is and this is what i want this is who i want to vote for So Donald Trump says, "Don't do it. Come to the voting polling station and vote over there because there is a lot of mail fraud that happens." Twitter on that tweet said, "Fact check," basically saying that what the president of the United States of America is saying may or may not be correct, true, accurate, could or could not be relied on, and therefore Twitter started doing things like fact check. Anything that Twitter decided that it was not sure of the validity of the information, they started putting fact check. tabs next to the post that used to come up it was hilarious that one of the first times i noticed it was when the president of the united states of america which is supposed to be one of the most heralded uh, posts that are held of the most powerful man in the world uh, and an organization like twitter a service provider like twitter says hey hame bharosa nahi hai ye jo bol rahe hain wo sahi hai ki nahi aap khud hi check kar lijiye so issues relating to that is issues relating to force major the uh, inability to perform contractual obligations also have come up now this this is with respect to everything starting from rental agreements to completion of construction contracts again force major comes in contractual um, obligations come in um, interpretation of contractual statutes come in and things like this are happening the indian evidence act has gone through a little bit of change during this uh, this period which has led to a lot of change in the law recently a three judge bench passed a decision on um, the indian evidence act which has drastically changed the production of evidence and the ability to produce evidence in a court of law it has that directly has nothing to do with the covid pandemic but uh, it's it's come at a stage where the digital world is is grappling with the kind of problems that we are facing and then this clarification from the uh, three judge bench led by um, rohington justice rohington nariman has provided a lot of clarity and created at the same time a lot of confusion with respect to what the future of electronic evidence because everything is electronic nowadays now for example i'm taking this this um, uh, webinar this goes up on youtube it becomes information which is available in terms of copyright in terms of trademark because the ves logo is going to be there there are a lot of ramifications which come up with respect to this can this be produced as evidence in a court of law and if so how a lot of questions that come up which cannot be escaped anymore our lives are now digital the sooner you embrace that and therefore our threats are also um, uh, digital the sooner you embrace the reality of what we are confronted with in the next 5 10 15 years the more effective you will be in providing solutions to the potential problems that your clients are going to have so thank you so much for this opportunity bhushan sir i'm going to wind up because um 
I've run out of time. My my beeper has already buzzed. I'm sorry, I took more time than I should have. But um, we can throw the uh, the floor open for questions, if any. But let me just thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you. It's a little different and strange for me also because I can only see my own face while delivering a lecture, which is disconcerting to say the least. And it's not something that I'm used to. I'm used to standing in front of an audience and speaking where I can see facial reactions. I don't even know if there's anybody online. Uh, the, the, the reality of the situation is I don't know how many people are watching this, if there are any people watching this. And so this is new for us teachers as well. So thank you so much for, if you are there, thank you so much for attending this. And if you have any queries, um, Bhushan sir, we could start taking them on. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think that was quite an enlightening session. Uh, frankly, let me tell you in terms of statistics, since you are uh, worried whether there is anybody on the other side, we had more than 200 persons joining and okay. quite a few people okay. liking the session already. Uh, and yes, as you said, you know, thank this you. is the new normal, like, you know, we uh, seeing ourselves in the camera, not the way we are used to. Uh, so thank you, sir, for taking us the entire journey in the past four months, especially how the COVID-19 has, you know, is making us more and more responsible with regards to the use of technology. Also Good. how, uh, sir, also took us through the threats that are posed, you know, with the financial frauds that are taking place, uh, especially with also issues regarding to privacy and extortion for, for as which the youth should be care careful about. Uh, sir, also uh, mentioned about frauds relating to uh, PMKS and the ROG Setu app and some basic precautions that we could take while downloading apps. Uh, and finally, of course, the much talked issues about voice locker room and the responsibility for WhatsApp admin. So that was quite an enriching session. Uh, you know, Thank even you, after sir. reading so much about cyber law, uh, it's, I think there is every time there is something new that Gopul Narayan sir offers to us. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you so, so much, starting sir. with the Q&A session before that, uh, let me also share with the audience that uh, Asian Law School, uh, the Vivekan College of Law in association with Asian Law School, we have a diploma course running. Uh, we have had a fantastic journey of two years, and this is the third year that we'll be starting our admission soon. Uh, you must be having the details, contact details on the uh, messages that you have received for registration. Uh, you can contact the same person, that's me, uh, and we'll be beginning the admissions from August 1st. So that's one important uh, announcement that I wanted to make. So let's start with the uh, Q&A session. Uh, yeah. There's this question. I don't know. I've just tried to filter a few of the questions. Uh, somebody has asked about the issue of phishing and how we yeah. can protect ourselves from online fraud, which I think you have extensively spoken about. Uh, yes. But I would just leave it to you if you want to add anything. So so a, a few of the basic things that you could do is, first of all, like I said, the compromise of the device is something that we can control. So if we can control what we click on, what kind of information for any kind of fraudster to install a, a, a recording device into our system, or for us to give away the information to another person, we need to click on content. Now, the, one of the most basic precautions that can be taken is stop clicking on links that you are not sure of. So if you want to find information about, so for example, if you want to use your HDFC online banking system or your payment gateway, don't click on a link that's coming which says that click here to go on to HDFC. Go on to HDFC, log in through the normal process, and then uh, execute the app or whatever you want to. If you directly click on the link, you have no means of understanding whether that link is directing you to the original app or is that a fake app uh, or a fake site which has been Im implemented on top. Now, there are other security features that you should implement. You should have a good antivirus, which has um, the ability to look at links and filter links out, which, is, which are not correct. You should look at the um, security features in the website itself. So there's something known as an SSL or a secured socket layer, which is an encryption based system, which is generally available only in authentic websites. You should look at the link. You should look at the URL of the website and see if they've got a digital certificate, which authenticates the website to you. So these are basic things that you should be aware of. Along with this, what I suggest to everybody is as a part of an intrusion detection system, have a firewall in place. Because what a firewall does is in case, even if you make the mistake of clicking on a link which you shouldn't be clicking on and your antivirus is unable to detect something that is happening, the firewall still restricts the inflow and outflow of information from your computer. What does a firewall do? It's like a chokidar standing at your gate, which checks everything that goes in and goes out. So even if your system gets compromised, 
the amount of information that will escape your computer will then further be reduced so just don't use an antivirus use a good firewall along with an antivirus to completely protect yourself which basically means it's an intrusion detection and prevention system it's an antivirus is just one part of that intrusion detection and prevention system but please understand antiviruses are only as effective as the antivirus databases like uh, antivirus is exactly like what the health industry is right now we can't cure coronavirus there are millions of people who are dying but we don't have a cure to it by the time we have a cure to it a lot of people would have died antivirus is exactly like that when a new virus comes out the antivirus companies also need to find a cure to that virus what is the vulnerability that is exploiting and therefore what kind of cure needs to be given to the vulnerability that does not mean that you shouldn't have an antivirus iska matlab ye nahi ki kyunki corona virus hai hum baaki vaccines nahi lete hain hum lete hain because we need to protect ourselves from those threats at least update your systems regularly do not postpone updates jaise hi update aata hai don't say ek hafte baad karenge ek mahine baad karenge the updates released for a reason it's a vulnerability possibly that has been recognized by your system and it says that we provided a solution to it which may or may not be exploited by people depending upon who you are so update your systems uh, uh, regularly please do not use pirated versions of operating systems because that's like a back door entry into your computer koi free mein aapko operating system kyon dega agar de raha hai to usme first of all update nahi hoga to wo vulnerable hoga aur jo de raha hai usne 100% uske andar koi na koi back door entry bana ke rakhi hogi taki wo aapke computer ke andar bina aapki anumati ke ghus jaye so use authentic software update the software and your computers regularly use an antivirus use um uh, what do you say an intrusion detection system and an intrusion prevention system but least of all please make sure that you have a firewall the windows defender firewall is a very very basic firewall which is not good enough to protect your computer you need a more advanced firewall okay i hope that answers think, the question sir yeah i rather that answers more than one question because we had two to three more questions related to antiviruses i, I think even that has been answered here uh, right. so there is one more question that uh, has been asked on a repetitive basis that uh, somebody has asked that can if a phone is switched off yeah even then can since we have granted permission to use camera to various apps so even then can they track the can the camera be used to track your movements or track your pictures and no. if i may add to this there is also a similar uh, question by our faculty member that can even the location be tracked if the phone is switched off and so, can so i can add one Sorry, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, one yes. more there's one more question can uh, incognito tabs can they track your information so sir, i thought since they are similar i'd ask it together okay uh, uh, the incognito question is a slightly different question i'm going to address that last but with okay. respect to uh, the mobile phone camera the camera requires to be on to be able to record any information a switched off camera cannot record information and therefore the first question is can your camera record information if it's switched off your mobile phone record information through the camera if it's switched off no it cannot a switched off it doesn't have any power the ability to record information using the camera it's not a manual camera it's a digital camera the digital camera requires power to be able to function if it's switched off it cannot do anything secondly right. Right. can uh, the, the second question was with respect to tracking of the mobile phone now the tracking of the mobile phone is a different concept altogether the tracking of the mobile phone basically even a mobile even when a mobile phone is switched off it has a receiver in it which will constantly keep tracking itself to the nearest signal tower that it has it will not however so so what it does is for example google Google always knows where you are. Google knows everything about you. Let's 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 start off with that. Google knows you better than your spouse does, better than your um, partner does, better than your parents do. Google knows everything possibly about you. Ah, yeah, ah, please. So Google knows everything about you. Now, even if your mobile, so Google first of all knows where you went, how long you went for, because it keeps tracking uh, through the signal towers where the physical location of the individual is. Now, even if you switch off your mobile phone, what Google does it is it keeps data in the mobile phone itself it it look the location services are still working but they do not transmit the information when you actually switch the mobile phone back on then it in bulk sends all that information back to google saying ki itne time tak ye vyakti is jagah pe ruka hua tha so that's how location services function and and yes therefore even if the mobile phone switched 
off the signal towers will still be able to communicate with it it is not live and active but that information of the signal towers then gets passed on when the mobile phone gets switched on so in an off state it cannot communicate but it can still gather information does that make sense yeah it yeah. cannot communicate but it can gather the information and after the device is switched on then depending upon the software that tries to gather this information they can get for how long where who was so it might be very difficult for the police to get to know uh, or or uh, or or get information about a lost mobile phone but if google was handed over this this task they would be able to find devices a lot easier than uh, than than law enforcement officers would be because Uh, the access to information through google is far more widespread we use um, uh, google location services through maps we use uh, gmail we use actually everything i mean our lives are on google so yeah google will know the last question is with respect to the incognito tab now once the incognito tab is switched on so let me clarify this point to you your browsing history is always stored on your computer let me say it as categorically as i can aap incognito mode use karo jo mode use karna hai kar lo aapka browsing history aapke computer pe hai the incognito mode only allows the regular files with respect to your browsing history not to be accessible through the settings option aap settings mein browsing history mein jaoge to incognito tab agar on hoga to wahan pe record nahi hoga there are other files which are system hidden files in your computer which will still maintain information about what browsing you did what you downloaded how much you downloaded and things like that that's what data forensics basically is when we analyze a device we do not look at the browsing history from the history which is available through the browser itself because that depending upon what uh, features you've implemented may or may not uh, record that information however you also need to remember is just because you put on an incognito mode that does not mean that your service provider will not know what you've done the service provider always knows it's the the incognito mode merely protects the data from the browsing history of the devices browser bas us pe dikhai nahi dega aapko graphical user interface jo hai browser ka jaise ki internet explorer ka ya fir google chrome ka um us pe aapko dikhai nahi dega ki um कौन सा ब्राउजिंग किया है द कंप्यूटर इन इट सेल्फ इन सेपरेट फाइल्स वुड हैव स्टोर दैट इंफॉर्मेशन एंड सर्टेनली योर सर्विस प्रोवाइडर इज गिविंग यू इंटरनेट आल्सो नोस एक्जेक्टली व्हाट यू हैव डन ओके थैंक यू सर दैट वाज क्वाइट एन इलैबोरेट आंसर देयर आर क्वाइट अ फ्यू क्वेश्चंस बट विल टेक वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन फॉर द डे इज देयर एन एजेंसी फॉर ऑथेंटिकेशन ऑफ एप्स सिंस देयर इज अ कंफ्यूजन अबाउट व्हिच एप टू डाउनलोड व्हिच इज अ फेक एप no there is no agency because these are i mean no agency is taking on the responsibility of trying to figure out uh, which apps are authentic which apps are not authentic you will have to use your own discretion to try and figure out uh, so, so so some of the things that i i do is before i download any app onto my computer or my uh, or my mobile phone more importantly my mobile phone what i do is i read reviews i go do an extensive review check i see if the same app is available on the play store also i see the details of the creator of the app i go and look at who the software developer of the app is and look at what their history is before i get excited about downloading anything i do a thorough study of who has made that app what is the credentials of the individuals who is the software developer of that app how many downloads have taken place and what are the customer reviews if you do these four checks it is very unlikely that you will un, un, end up downloading an app which is a fake app very unlikely aap ye char cheeze hain kariye and you should be safe from um, fake um, apps according to me thank you sir like i said there are quite a few more questions but we'll keep it keep them for some other day Sure, uh, sure. Before proposing the vote of thanks, uh, I would like to convey that there is a feedback link available in the description box of the event. Uh, please fill the same. Our volunteers will also share the feedback link at the end of the comment section, and that will be done at the end of the event. Uh, I request the participants as well to join our social media channels to get more updates about our upcoming webinars and events. Uh, so I would like to propose a vote of thanks, sir. It was a great, or it is a great honor to propose the vote of thanks and. to convey my gratitude towards all those who made this event a success first of all a hearty vote of thanks to our speaker gokul narayan sir like i said you know uh, the, it's there's always something new sir whenever we interact with you so thank you for gracing today's uh, thank webinar you, and thank you for this interesting and thought provoking address
uh, i would also like to profess our uh, ex uh, express our profound gratitude yeah. towards uh, bulani sir uh, and as well as advocate dr lakshman karna sir who is the management trustee of our college my sincere thanks to dr dushit deshmukh madam for her support as a principal of vs college of law and special thanks to mrs uh, vinita singh for graciously providing us the technical aid i would also like to uh, thanks and express my gratitude to the participants who have turned in such a good, good number like i told you sir uh, the numbers tell us that we have more than 200 participants so yes there okay. were people who were watching you and last but not the least uh, as in every uh, event of vs college of law uh, be it in person or virtual sir we have a very strong team working around the clock for making yeah. every event a success and so thank you team webinar for making this event a success uh, we will be having thank you guys thank you so much for such, thank you sir i also wanted to thank um, uh, bhushan sir durgesh harsh and um, i'm sorry uh, i don't know the name of the lady who's handling the apeksha, virtual apeksha. part apeksha apeksha thank you so much for this um, uh, it, it was very seamless and it was extremely easy i had to do nothing generally in in webinars that i that i take i have to do everything as in organize the audience um uh, organize the lecture make sure that everybody is logged in it was just nice to just come on board uh, take the lecture and not be worried about any of these ancillary uh, questions but thank you so much sir thank you so much for this opportunity and um, uh, thank you guys for organizing this thank you sir so before signing off i would like to once again convey that uh, vs college of law in association with asian law, asian school of cyber law we have a diploma in cyber law course starting from the admissions will start from 1st august the details will be conveyed to you as you are also part of the telegram group the details will be conveyed thank you once again have a thank great you. day thank bye you. bye